All right, we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like we have quite a crowd today. So thank you so much all for jumping on. We really appreciate it. Um, I do want to point out that we are recording today's call and it will be posted on the Women in Partner channel, um, on the, part, uh, the Women in Partner YouTube channel um, shortly following this call. And so thank you so much for all joining us today. If you do not want to be recorded, um, we are recommending that you drop from the call. Um, and watch the recording. Heather will also be doing some discussion at the end, and I know this group, for those of you who have been on previous calls um, the last few months, uh, we've had some really great dialogue, and so that too will be part of the recording, and I just want to let you guys know, um, know that prior to going into the call. So this is our monthly uh, web seminar for women and partner, and uh, we do have our LinkedIn group. I think we're uh, just north of 400 members on our LinkedIn site. So thank you for all of you that have joined that. Um, you can see the group here on the screen. And if you'd like to join, please go ahead and join our LinkedIn group. And we will, it's an approval process, but if you're a Microsoft employee or a partner within our channel, we are um, more than happy to approve you into the, the Microsoft and Women in Partner group. My name is Sarah Jertebig. Um, I am a business manager for the national sales organization at Microsoft. I've been with the company for 16 years, and so I'm really looking forward. It's, it's very fun to, to listen to these calls every month and see the, the growth that we're having with people joining the calls. And so thank you again for being here today with us. Um, just a quick recap. It was just over a year ago, and some of you saw this last month. It was just over a year ago that um, Lindsay and, and the group of people that you saw on the last slide um, launched the Microsoft and Women in Partner program and or initiative. And we have had some really great success, and I'm looking forward. Oh, I did not update this slide. It's north of 400 now <laughs> as far as members on LinkedIn. Um, we've had some great success around some luncheons that we've done. Our web seminars continue to grow in size. Uh, last month we had about 75, which I think has been our largest web seminar to date. Um, so we're, we're super excited about that. Um, we're looking to do some things at our Worldwide Partner Conference or Inspire this summer, um, the new name of Inspire. Um, and so we look forward to meeting with you then and connecting with all of you. I do want to just call out, save the date for some of the upcoming seminars. Um, next month, Lindsay's Wart will be talking about your brand, your career, your journey on April 27th. And she has, I, I've had the opportunity to listen to her speak on this topic many times. And she just has a really great story and really great insights to share with you around thinking about what, what your brand is. Um, and how your journey progresses throughout um, the different stages of your life and some different tips and tricks that come from that. So I'd strongly encourage you to register for that particular event. Um, I'm working with Marita right now. For those of you that know Marita, she used to be the VP of our Dynamics Group in the US. And she um, has agreed to speak in May, so we're just trying to figure out a date right now. She spoke at our lunch that we had um, the initial year that we launched the program last February. Um, at a Dynamics event that we had and was just absolutely fabulous. People loved her. She has a great story and it will be fun to reconnect with her for those of you that were, had the opportunity to hear her speak um, at that luncheon and what she's done since leaving Microsoft um, just about a year ago. And then in June, we have Lou Solomon coming to talk about combating the imposter. And so we just launched that registration today as well. And so please go ahead and register for that. We'll update you on our Inspire plans um, as we get closer. And then we do have our August and September speakers locked with Mia Beck and Laura Butler. Mia is an author of Sensitivity and Strength. And Laura Butler is a CVP of the One, um, at Microsoft in the OneNote division. So um, great lineup for the next six months. And I believe that we have, we meet on Monday. And I think we have three or four additional speakers that are um, that are going to be lined up that we'll go into the October time frame with. So um, great momentum with the program. If there's any suggestions you guys have, please, please, please feel free to pass those our way. That said, it is my absolute pleasure 
um, to introduce our speaker for today. And just a little bit about Heather. She was raised in Las Vegas, Nevada, and she started her career in the casino industry, um, doing casino events, which sounds like a lot of fun, actually, um, on the Las Vegas Strip. And five years ago, she and her husband moved up to the Northwest. And so since then, she's been part of the Worldwide Partner Group, the One Commercial Partner Group, and she has continued to evolve her role into um, activities around Inspire, and most recently, um, owning the relationship with the IA, I'm going to get this wrong, Heather, IAMCP Women in Technology community, and that is a community that I know people on this call are a part of, and we have spoken with them many times about how we collaborate more together. So I am really, really excited to have Heather join us today. And I had the opportunity to talk to her before the call started, and, and she just has some some great kind of insights and and perspectives around um, around the topic that we're talking on today. And so we're really looking forward to that. And I was looking at her deck, going, "Hmm, this is going to be really insightful <laughs> for my next job negotiation." But with that <laughs> said, it is my honor and pleasure um, to introduce you to Heather Doran, and um, I'll turn it over to you, Heather. Thanks so much, Sarah, uh, and gosh, thank you to the 68 women that we have already on this call. Uh, that's kind of just amazing, um, considering if we think about day-to-day, -day, I'm sure for many of you uh, in your day-to-day -day work life, you're maybe running into one or two women in the building or in your meetings. Um, it always is interesting to me when I head over to one of the engineering buildings or uh, another building outside of Microsoft or our marketing team, uh, how few women I am seeing just generally in the hallways and you know one of the things that I told Sarah um, as Sarah mentioned I've recently become the um, Microsoft liaison to the IAMCP I always join I always say say that ten times fast uh, the International Association of Microsoft Channel Partners women technology arm and uh, I think what has inspired me so much, and I think also why all of you are part of this organization as well, is um, in this industry, I think we need to um, find these connection points, find our community, find those opportunities when we can share our fears, our failures, our successes, and be championed by one another. Um, and so it's just awesome to be talking to you all today about the topic of negotiation. Um, the Art of Negotiations is, is my, the topic of my presentation today. And by the way, this topic came out of um, a partner in a meeting that uh, our team had uh, about six months ago or so who raised her hand and, and my manager happened to be in the room and, and she said, you know, I just really want to know more about negotiating. I see these men around me and they're constantly negotiating for better deals and better prices and you know they'll come in from being out on the weekend shopping for cars and they'll talk about this great deal that they negotiated and oh by the way then I hear murmurings over there by the water cooler that they just negotiated for a big raise and oftentimes I'm left thinking wow I'm behind the boat what am I missing? And that was what a partner told us. And I just found that to really resonate when I heard that as well. And um, and just thinking in terms of, gosh, we need more information. We need, we need more real life tangibles. Uh, we need to think about how we can negotiate day to day and not just about our job or salary, but of course I know for many of you that's kind of top of mind, right? But also just in everyday work and business. And um, I think it's a great topic. Um, Sarah, right now I'm still seeing the upcoming webinars uh, slide on the screen. Do you want me to take over as presenter? Yeah, that would be great. Sorry, I okay. no, that's <laughs> I no didn't problem. Switch it. I was so um, enthralled in your <laughs> intro. I guess I forgot to hit forward on the slide. No, it's no you. problem. I've got it here. Um, and you know, when we think about negotiations, I really do think it's an art, and I think that there's no right way, but I think it's about finding your own best way and a way that you become ultimately comfortable, a way that is so authentic to you, but that is ultimately getting you the outcome that you're driving for. And so um, when I think about negotiations, it's not just about what can I do for you in order for you to get what you want, but 
in order for us to provide what we need. And the term we, I think, is so critical here that it's, that it's not an I, it is a we conversation. Um, even though at times when I'm seeing these discussions even happening around me about negotiations, you know, you know, the guy that comes into the office that says, oh my gosh, I got this amazing deal on this car this weekend, and, you know, I spent four hours just hammering them, and I got exactly what I want. You know, we have to think about, well, what did the dealership get out of it? It Was there this give-get scenario and this equal value proposition to some degree? Um, you know, when we look at the data, and I feel like so often you'll see through your Facebook feed or you might be scrolling through a, a news site and you'll come across so many different stats about this and I think that it continues to be an ongoing discussion and some of the most recent studies that I found you know show that starting salaries of males with MBAs who recently graduated, you know, that, that they're earning on average almost $4,000 higher than those female MBAs from the same program. And the root of this that I think is really interesting, and I um, think it's always interesting when you ask a, a group to raise their hand, which is who actually negotiated on that initial salary offer? The differential of that $4,000 was really because most of the women in this study had just simply not had simply accepted what that initial offer was and hadn't gone back and said, oh, I would like a little bit more, or can we negotiate on the benefit side, or can we negotiate on more vacation time? And therefore, so it begins, right? The baseline already, um, there is there is a differential. And in another study, this gender difference was looked at and subjects were told, hey, you're going to be observed playing a word game and as you're playing this game, you'll be paid between $3 and $10 for playing. Again, this is in a research lab. And after each subject completed the task, the experimenter thanked the participant and said, okay, here's $3. Is $3 okay? And for the men, they said, no, it's not okay. And for the women, they said, Thank you very much. And so I think it just, there it begins, right? And I think that there's also these anecdotal stories that I've heard of just, you know, childhood. At, at such a young age, girls are not learning the skills that they need to negotiate, even just on the playground. And, you know, how can we start to immerse um, girls at a young age in high school and um, in college and give them those preparedness and those tips to be successful at negotiating throughout their life. And so successful negotiations don't begin as a demand or an ultimatum, but gosh, how many of us on this call have sometimes felt like that's the case? Um, you know, if I think back, and so many of you on this call have been with Microsoft uh, for so many years, and I think have more stories to tell than certainly I do, but when I think about when I joined this company um, uh, over four years ago, I think about some of the volatility and intensity within the team I was in and that it did oftentimes feel like when I was working with a colleague or somebody across from another team that they would come to me with an offering or something we needed to work on together and it felt like a demand, it felt like an ultimatum um, and, and hopefully that resonates with some of you on this call and I just feel like I all of a sudden I have all these stories that just came into my mind, you know, of where if you don't do this, I will escalate. How many of you have heard that, <laughs> right? Especially years past, and I think the culture is changing and evolving, but, um, you know, that is a good thing. Um, but successful negotiations don't begin in that way, right? We're already then off put and we're already on the defense. So when you're thinking about your next negotiation, whether it be in work life, whether it be with your child or your husband, or, or whether it be some of those more serious topics that, may be top of mind about a salary negotiation or a new job um, that we need to think about it in terms of is there an alternative solution that can benefit both you and I and really looking at it from that that give get scenario. Do any of you on the call kind of have a, an example that you might want to share with the audience around that where you know you may have been um, hit up to negotiate and just already setting the tone in the wrong way. Somebody came to you with a demand and you just felt like how am I going to negotiate with this person when they're just not even looking at it from both sides. 
And if anybody wants to share, feel free just to get off mute and, and say, hey, Heather, I've got a story for you. <laughs> you know, I often, um, because I think this topic is very interesting, and then, by the way, there's a variety of TED Talks. I encourage you, if this is a topic that you're really gearing up for, if you are gearing up to maybe as you head into um, your connects or your reviews, um, think about how you might negotiate. I have found that some of the resources, those TED Talks that exist, um, books can really help with that. But I'll tell you, in some of the discussions that I've had with other women, that is really helpful. If you can lean on a mentor, a coach, a best friend, and say, can we do some modeling? Can we do some role play? Here's what I, the discussion I'm gearing up to have. I don't know how it's going to go. Can we do some role play? And the practice, practice, practice. And uh, in Sheryl Sandberg's book, and by the way, Sheryl Sandberg has been speaking out on this topic as of late um, quite a bit. And she just says, you know, get bold, get creative, ask for what we want. And what I love about that is when you when you think about being bold, okay, got it. I've got to shoot for the shoot for the moon and fall fall among the stars. But the get creative piece, that's where I think women really have an advantage, is to be creative in this discussion, look at it from both sides, um, and look at, look for opportunities to negotiate, get what we want, be creative at it, and also make sure that there is a win for both sides. I always think it's interesting when you look beyond the substance at the onset and then look at the differences between men and women and how, in many cases, and of course everybody is a unique individual and some people's personality traits and really the way their brain works um, may hinge more towards some of the mannerisms that are in the male-focused uh, column versus the female. But I think just for generally the um, discussion at hand, I think you can follow me here. And, and maybe this will resonate too when I think about who is the most successful negotiator on my team? You know, what are some of the mannerisms of that individual? And hopefully you had one or two people just pop in your mind and really think about why are they so so successful? And you know, the person that pops into my mind it does happen to be a male. Uh, he is very directive. Uh, he is is always using the, that conversation to solve a problem. You might um, also think about it in terms of this person that's in my mind, at least. You know, he is a smooth talker, right? He's just got this charm, this appeal, uh, uses conversation to really get at the point. But at times, there's some aggression there. And certainly somebody who comes into the room with just full force, full energy taking up two chairs practically with his arm across the tops of them to lean in and have that discussion around the table. And, and so, you know, when I came across some of these differences and some of these mannerisms, that seemed to resonate with me also. Um, whereas if you look at some of the mannerisms in many of the females, and I, of course I just call upon in my mind, What's the most recent business review I've had? How did the females across the table behave versus the men? You know, acting, asking less direct questions, um, using conversation more for connection and building on that empathy and the relational aspect of it, not necessarily to just solve a problem. And, you know, this last piece I think is interesting too. Women tend to avoid taking physical control in a meeting. And for those Microsoft employees on the call today, um, a training, if you haven't already taken it, um, I think was one of the most powerful for me was executive presence for women. Look it up on the, um, on the training and learning site. Are there any women on the call, by the way, if you want to enter into the IM window that have taken that training? Um, would love to hear from you if you have, because I felt it was um, incredibly powerful, Janet. Yeah, and because, my gosh, there are so many things that I was learning that I was doing that were not allowing me to have that invisible power in the room um, to at least start out on the right foot. If I'm going to go to the table, the bargaining table, and negotiate um, for some additional funding for a project that I have, or you know, negotiate for some additional support or resourcing, you know, what am I doing to immediately um, set the right tone? Yes, the name of the training 
um, is Pat, it's given by Pat Kirkland Leadership, and it's through Microsoft, and it's Executive Presence for Women. Um, and Janet, you're exactly right. I, I loved it. I encourage it for every woman on this call to advocate to get in this training. I thought it was very powerful. Um, a few things I just want to comment on that I that we learned in this training, and that I think could be a great opportunity for you is we learned about you know who's the predator at the table. Think about your last meeting that you were in. Who were the people that either through um, their nonverbal or through their verbal were indicating that they have power over you versus who are the other individuals at the table who were kind of taking on this prey position where the others in the room, the predators, had power over them. You know, thinking about that um, I think is really key. And Debbie, thanks for your note there. Um, I think that there could be an opportunity there, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And, you know, what, what we learned through this tra training, I just want to just give you some anecdotes here, and then Janet, I'd love for you to speak up too if you have anything to add, but um, to me, the nonverbal when beginning a negotiation is so critical to bring to the table that confidence, to take up more space than you're used to, um, to have that direct eye contact, that still body. How many of you are tapping your toes underneath the table or, you know, for me, I find I'm constantly rubbing my fingers together. Um, to have more of that low pitch, that slow pace. Another quick uh, Bing search, if you're interested in it, is called Vocal Fry. It's, uh, it's the way that Kim Kardashian speaks and some of those more youthful um, celebrities um, that you see and, and pull up some YouTube videos on it. I find it fascinating. But what we learned, learned in this training is how to avoid vocal fry, that very high pitch, um, and it's almost a forced pitch um, that particularly there's been some studies, younger girls, younger women are trying to emulate that way of speaking and what it doesn't provide is it doesn't provide that command, that low pitch, slow pace of talking that brings command and draws others to you so that you can have more of that invisible power at the table before you negotiate. Um, and then building on some of these skills and competencies for what is called partnering behaviors. So less predator behavior building on the prey behavior to go into pa partner mode, partnering to begin that negotiation, to have those distinct dis discussions and build an unconscious status in the room through your behaviors. And Sally, I think you're exactly right. And, and I don't know the difference between up talk versus vocal fry, but um, I, I should read up a little bit more on that. But I think you're exactly right, Sally. And you know, women are doing this and unconsciously it is taking away from the power that they have in the conversation. Um, and I think that that's so critical and just something for us all to be more, more self-aware. Okay, so now getting it. Oh, thank you for these TED Talk um, resources and all these links. Great discussion. I almost feel like we need to have another conversation about this because I do find it fascinating. Um, so moving on to what is a good negotiation, and again, the goal is not to get a deal, the goal is to get a good deal. And what I like about that terminology about deals is that deals typically result in outcomes for both sides. Again, getting away from this predator versus prey scenario and more into that um, partner scenario. And so certainly getting a good deal is the desired outcome of a negotiation where an agreement may not. Um, every bad deal is a, good, is a deal to which you have agreed. And, you know, that helps to build relationships, not tarnish them. Um, and again, sometimes I think back to um, earlier days at Microsoft where it was just so intense and this negotiation was draining me. I found at the end of the day, I felt like I had to negotiate for every seat and every moment and everything that I needed to get my job done. That's not necessarily a good deal. What we know is that when women do 
uh, go forth to try and negotiate their salaries. They don't negotiate their salaries like men do. That's to say they don't negotiate them as often. We know that for sure. And they don't have the same experiences. And they generally don't achieve the same outcomes. Um, and what we know also is that when women try to negotiate, again, this is, uh, this is very um, more standardized and everybody has a unique and different position on this, but I think generally when women are negotiating, they shouldn't be negotiating the same way as men if they want to be successful. There was a Harvard study done by two women who looked at techniques and uh, techniques that, that more actively benefited women um, rather than, than men. Uh, that is to say that by taking our own path or by using skills um, or steps to negotiate that were different than the way men do, it ultimately provided the outcome that they were looking for. Um, so, you know, the first one is to think personally but act communally. I think there's a comfort level for women to do that. Um, I think there's also a comfort level to replace the word I with we when, when negotiating. And I think that's okay. And in fact, this Harvard study backed that up, that even though we are comfortable, more comfortable saying we, and we do have that int intuition to do so, um, that in fact, that's okay, because ultimately we're looking to get a good deal and we're looking to leverage that partner scenario. Selling your ability, ability to negotiate is a good thing. And this one scared me. When I read this one, I thought, well, first of all, I'm just diving into this whole negotiation thing. I don't even think I have a comfort level yet. And now you're telling me I've got to go sell my ability to negotiate? And that felt deflating to me. Um, but as I read on, on this point, you know, to further mitigate the negative perceptions that come up around women in negotiation, remind the person that you're negotiating with that you're actually on the same team. And there's a comfort level and there's actually an, an innate um, uh, positive opportunity for women when they do that and they're comfortable in doing that. When you're asking for a raise or a promotion, these are the only times you'll really be on opposite sides of the table, although I think I can think of some other scenarios when that could happen, but it is a skill that we as women bring to the team. Uh, that we're on the same side, we're looking for some of the same objectives and outcomes, but yes, we may need to negotiate on some key points. These are abilities and innate traits that women have that I think can help us all uh, when we're working to negotiate on that point. And then explaining why your request is legitimate. You know, you have the goods, you have to make your case. I think we as women are comfortable doing that. Um, and particularly when we're talking about our performance evaluation or a raise, um, we as women can talk about industry standards and some of the data and talking about anecdotally um, some of the value that we have brought to the organization. And, and that's what we as women are good at doing. And that's another step that we can take that I think could benefit us. Um, and then fourth, understanding your counterpoint's point of view and bringing that to the table. Um, this is really the secret for negotiations for everyone. And I think women, because we're, we're such good readers of a room and we can oftentimes understand different perspectives and point of views, um, that when we find out what's important to the person on the other side of the table that we're negotiating with, we can then see where our priorities are and how our priorities overlap and really use that information to come to a compromise uh, when negotiating. So, you know, on this slide right here, I think your takeaway is, you know, looking at what are the alternatives, uh, what are the reservations when you're negotiating with somebody, what are their reservations against what you're talking about or what you're shooting for, and then positioning the overall aspiration for the deal, showing we're on the same sides of the table and we're really looking for some ultimate outcomes that are very similar. The other opportunity that I think we as women have is preparing for those negotiations. So many of the women that I'm around here in, in business and, and the partners that I'm working with, gosh, how often is it 
that we are the ones showing up to the table so much more prepared than perhaps our counterparts, going above and beyond, um, always doing more than is asked of us. I see this time and time and time again, and I think there's other discussions and other things that have been written on this subject as well that in many cases, women are overcompensating. Um, and uh, to that degree, you know, and I think that's a whole other conversation, but I think ultimately when it comes back to negotiations, we're prepared. We know how to get prepared. We know how to be organized. Uh, moving over to the conversation window in the IM, I just want to make sure I uh, am speaking to some of the comments you have. We shouldn't do it exactly the same as men if it's not natural for us. And I think that authenticity piece is so key. Each of us is, is unique in our own way and has a style um, that we'll call our own. And some of you, you know, some of the um, male personifications that I just talked about, that might resonate with you also. And it's all about leveraging that to um, your ability and, and to your benefit. Um, the question here from Barbara, I want to learn more constructive assertiveness, but I don't care for aggression in men or women. And there's the reality that women are penalized, the double bind, yep, that, that B word, right? Uh, if you come across in the wrong way, and I just, I completely understand what you're saying there, Barbara, and I, I think that there is a lot of discussion on that as well. Um, so thank you for that. But um, when we talk about preparing for, for negotiations, um, you know, I think about you know, doing the homework, getting the data, um, building your case, thinking when we talk about salary, for example, thinking outside of just your salary and looking at what else could you negotiate on in the moment. If salary was a non-negotiable for whatever reason, could you take it a next step further, a plan B and negotiate for benefits? Take it a next step further, uh, plan C, negotiate for vacation time, and then ultimately just being realistic um, at the onset, I think is really important of what you think may or may not occur. And that is where I get to the role playing that I mentioned a little bit earlier. And, you know, one item that I might challenge even with this group itself as well, um, and maybe when we even get brought together at events like Microsoft Inspire or others, you know, maybe taking the time to leverage that opportunity of so many women being in, in the same place and do some of that role play activity, some of that exercise um, to get you comfortable doing that. Um, and there is homework leading up into that. Yvonne has also mentioned in the IM window, it looks like a book, Hardball for Women, uh, to understand those differences. Um, so great resource there as well. So as you're preparing to enter into a, a negotiation, you know, certainly women, I think, face these unique challenges that we've all just already described up until this point. And, um, and to me, you know, when I read these three things that came out of this Harvard study, you know what the first thing is that came to my mind? I said, now how many men do I know who are negotiating day in and day out have actually sat down, number one, gone to this level of preparedness, but number two, have sat, sat down and said, okay, why ex exactly am I asking? How exactly am I going to ask it? For whom am I asking for? And I just kind of chuckled to myself, right? Great questions that I think we as women have to ask ourselves, make sure we're prepared to outline and to talk about when we're negotiating. But it made me chuckle a little bit because, you know, again, going back to what I said earlier, who is the person in my organization that I think is the best negotiator? I'm not sure he does this. <laughs> so it made me laugh. But I think it's a great um, uh, at least a framework for you to begin on. And when we're talking about salary, when we're talking about that performance review, really having this well outlined, I think, puts us in um, a better position in a way to get what we want because we've shown, we've put in the legwork, we've thought about it, we're building our argument, we're looking at it holistically across the organization to see what benefits others and those that we're negotiating with. An interesting point on here that I do want to call out, and this is in the second box here in the minute, in the middle. The recommendation coming out of this study was stay away from single issue negotiations. Instead, package together those requests that you're looking for in kind of a bundled format. And I thought that's really interesting uh, way to think about it. You know, take the time, take the moment to bundle it together and make one request rather than kind of one-off requests, cons um, you know, consistently. So I thought that was a helpful piece of information. 
and then also you know making sure that whatever it is that you're trying to pitch again funding for resources salary benefits um, how is the proposal representing the interests of who it is we're looking out for and if you're a partner it would maybe be for your customer if it's for you as a Microsoft employee maybe it's it's for your partners etc um, so thinking about that in terms of that and when I think about you know Microsoft and as we're consistently working to try and be more customer centric more partner centric I think framing it up in that way is also really helpful any other comments or thoughts about what I've spoken about so far Great conversation in the IM window. Okay, so now uh, pivoting a little bit more here, talking about how women don't negotiate like men do. They don't negotiate as often, we talked about that, and they just don't have the same experiences to produce those same outcomes. Um, Again, I think that this is echoing where we as women have already the skills to be successful, but it's about practice, practice, practice. Is there anybody on the call that recently has engaged in a pretty intense negotiation and your outcome was positive, it was hard, but now you're feeling more confident to go into your next one? Is there anybody on the call that can give an example like that? You know, I think about, um, as Sarah mentioned, I, I sit on the Microsoft Inspire business owner team, and um, we do a lot of negotiating, uh, particularly with some of our big partners who are bringing um, in upwards of potentially a couple hundred partners to the event. And, you know, we're also negotiating for those sponsorships and those exhibitorships. And, and I think it can be often so challenging and tough. And, and because, Everybody's ask is a little bit different. There's no standardized model. Everybody's approach who's, who's kind of approaching us and approaching me and coming to this is, is a little bit different. And, and oftentimes I'm caught off guard, right? I'll be in a meeting and the partners will pull me aside and say, hey, Heather, I really want to negotiate with you a little bit on the price of the event and I'm bringing X number of, of people with me. How can you help me? And I think that's the hardest piece of negotiation. It's one thing if you've got a plan, a roadmap, you've got the time to do the market research, you've got the time to think about it from a personal perspective, but then think about the end goal of everyone. But then what happens if you're caught off guard and you're kind of cornered and you're having to negotiate on the fly. For me, that's the tough part. That's an area of opportunity that I have to improve where I need to do more modeling and I need to also watch my mannerisms and behavior. Coming out of that class that I talked about a little bit earlier, Executive Presence for Women, you know, it really allowed me to think about how I'm going to approach those big meetings, those presentations, those QBUs, those reviews, but it didn't help to equip me for those negotiations in the hallway. When somebody has sent you an email three hours ago and you haven't gotten to it yet and they swing by your desk in your office and they're ready to hammer it out. You're caught off guard, your facial expression might change, your mannerisms are feeling defense, uh, wanting to be very much in defense of yourself. Um, so I think that that's the hard part. But, you know, Ultimately, I think it's the practice that pays off and getting these frameworks kind of ingrained in your mind so that when you are in that moment, you can think more personally. You can sell your ability to negotiate as a good thing and, and draw upon that confidence or those role playing activities that you did to say, I can do this in this moment and I'm going to build that confidence and I'm going to go for it. And then, um, you know, this is just some other examples that we've talked about, but explaining why your request is legitimate and asking those questions to understand your counterpart's point of view. Is anyone on the call in PR? I did a PR training recently and one of that, one of the trainings was all about continuing to ask questions, pivoting, um, and, and really trying to stay on message. And I think if any of you have had some of that PR training, that can really help in terms of negotiating as well. So you can continue to probe and question and buy yourself some time so that you know how you can thoughtfully answer. And then mistakes to avoid when negotiating. And by the way, I really feel that um, as all of us are either embarking on this or are learning how to become better negotiators, we will all make mistakes throughout. 
Um, but I, I continue to hinge back on lessons or practice, practice, practice will help to get us through that. Um, and the reality is, depending on your personality type, if you're an extrovert, if you're an introvert, if you have anxiety, uh, you know, you've heard the statistic that one of the highest statistics out there of people who are just fearful of public speaking, I think negotiation is certainly on top of that list as well. Negotiation can feel stressful, it can be uncomfortable, and depending on what situation or scenario you're in, I mean, you'll lose some sleepless nights over this. Um, but reverting to a different study now, this was a Stanford University study, and it was coming from a very interesting part of that university. And, and by the way, they've got some um, content available on the web, but this is the Institute for Gender Research, Voice, and Influence Program. Again, I think this topic is really, really fascinating. Um, and uh, I can see here in the IM window that some of those links have disappeared. So I'll also try and see if I can find that out. Um, but I really think, you know, even though it is so stressful, it is uncomfortable, we've got a lot to learn, both in terms of our presence, our physical presence, our being, how we're showing up, but then also our technical negotiating skills, the technicality about around the, um, around how we are actually talking through these discussions. Um, ultimately, what the study found is most of the mistakes that women are making, even before they enter the conversation, right, that fear, that anxiety, that these common slip-ups have really nothing to do with the technical negotiating skills that you have, but far more to do with your attitude and your mindset, how you feel about yourself, your confidence level, your self-worth, and, um, and, and again, I, I think that it's about practicing some of these competencies of, you know, a still body, a neutral stance, those firm gestures, downward inflection in your voice, um, potentially even a little bit louder than average volume with short sentences and pausing. I mean, these are behaviors that I think um, lend themselves to creating this confidence that while you may not have it innately or you may not feel like you have it, it will get you to be in control of your communication, to come across as strong and open, um, sure of what you're saying, sounding very much in command and smarter and more understandable. Um, and so I think those are things that we've got to, we've got to all practice um, to, to, to build upon that. But, you know, assuming you're a bad negotiator, how many of us just outright think I'm a bad negotiator. You know, these negative mindsets, they can become these self-fulfilling prophecies that could just sabotage you. So, you know, building upon that, um, negotiating only at high pressure times, again, it goes back to this practice. Let's practice negotiating for the pencil, you know, and doing these kind of trial runs and experiments in these lower pressure settings so that when you are cornered out of the blue, when you are having kind of a hostile negotiation situation, um, how you can diffuse that and how you can bring about a successful outcome that you're looking at. And then failing to do your homework, really understanding that preparation is key and doing your research uh, to understand your counterpart um, and, and who you're up against. And so, you know, I think overall the opportunity here is asking for what you deserve, asserting yourself in the workplace, and really looking at those opportunities to overcome common slip-ups, taking some of these tips here to build upon the foundation that you may or may not already have, and help to make your next deal a successful outcome. So, you know, the top, um, the top common negotiation mistakes that women often make are really assuming that you are a bad negotiator when you probably aren't at all as bad as you think that you are. Um, and thinking about those high pressure times that may come out out of the blue. And maybe some of you are more familiar with those than others, but prepared for them. And then understanding those audiences that you may have to negotiate with in the future or that you may uh, come across unexpectedly as well. And by giving uh, multiple offers when you are negotiating in order to create that good deal, when making it clear that you are amenable, 
that you've got a little bit of flexibility and wiggle, wiggle room as you're negotiating, it often will empower the situation um, and allow the person that you're negotiation, negotiating with to give them a little bit of control. It will reduce overall the stress in the process as well as giving some additional options. So here's a scenario right here on the slide that we can walk through. So let's say you know you wanted to have a partner sell Office 365 and you know offer a is rapid entry into new geographies, that cross-border expansion strategy. Offer B is capitalizing on those vertical opportunities, or offer C, you know, increasing average revenue per user. You know, every option is the outcome you're looking to drive for more Office 365 seeds, but the lens of the business is shaped by a vision, shaped by potentially different scenarios. Um, and so I thought this was like a great example just in practice that maybe you could think about. And, and quite frankly, when I'm working on deals like this or scenarios where I've got to negotiate, I'm not often thinking about, well, what could the three options be that would result in the good deal that I'm looking for? I haven't usually thought that far ahead. And so to me, that was a great um, way of getting me to think about how I behave personally in these situations. Alicia, you've got a great um, story here about one of your assignments was to collect 10 no's. People keep asking for things until someone says no 10 times. Gosh, exhausting. Um, do you have anything else you want to add to that, Alicia? How, how long did that actually take for you to get 10 no's? Yeah, it, it took a while. It was amazing how often people actually said yes. And so you just ha would have to continue to ask for more things. And so it was harder than I thought. I think most of the class thought it would be you know, pretty easy to keep asking for things and collect 10 no's and be like, OK, I've completed the assignment. But it's amazing how often people actually said yes. So it, so it was harder than we thought. And you know, how many of you on the call, it's funny, my manager actually came back uh, and for Lent, she said, I'm going to start saying no more often. She said, last year I was giving up chocolate. This year I'm saying no. So every every couple of days I try to say, so how, how, how are you doing on the no's? Um, great point, Alicia. And I think we as women just generally, uh, we do more. We take on more. We're amazing multitaskers. Um, and we, we keep on keeping on. And so it is easy to say yes because we say yes so often and we do so much. And uh, I know it's very hard for me to say no. Just no in your personal life, no in the activities that you're doing outside of work, and then no professionally to those tasks, those stretch projects, those additional work streams. And uh, it definitely is a hard thing. And then just saying no when you're negotiating is certainly a hard one as well. So that wraps up the portion um, that I was going to speak to today. Um, I thought I'd take at least three more minutes here and, and answer any questions that you have. And then what we'll do is we'll move into a virtual exercise where I just want to give you a few minutes to kind of think about a recent negotiation, what the benefits of those were, what's important to you. Are you getting ready to go, up, go out and uh, embark on a negotiation? Uh, what are some of the issues that you came across? So we'll do this exercise here in a minute, and then I'd love to hear from you um, at the end. But um, anything top of mind that you're thinking about based on what you just heard? Oh, I like, Amy, what you said here in the IM window. Can you do better? Can you do better? Mm. I think so. One of the things that I've been thinking about through this um, because I, I personally think I'm great at negotiating, great. Um, but helping other women. So yeah. when you see other women that do struggle with this, and I have a couple folks in my mind, you know, what's the best way to help them mm -hmm. in this process? And to you know, me, learn, learning I, to be a better negotiator. I would love to have somebody like you, Lori who maybe saw in a meeting that I didn't quite negotiate well enough for that additional funding for a project. And, and I'd love for others on the call to speak up as well. But I know for me, I would love after the meeting if you said, gosh, Heather, I really think you could have gotten what you wanted. Um, I've been through a similar situation. Do you want to maybe do some role playing and maybe mm -hmm. see if you can go at it again uh, later this week 
and maybe hit them up again and see if, if you can if you can win that. To me, Lori, people like you have so much value that you can provide to the women on this call. Um, and I love Barbara has in the I'm Linda just said, I want a personal board of directors, people I can go to when I'm having a challenge or I've been not gotten the good deal that I'm looking for. People like you, Lori, that can say, I'm going to model this with you. I'm going to show you how I've been able to achieve this. I'm going to show you some of the techniques I have. Um, and Lori, where did you learn it from? Um, well, so my father had his own business for 38 years. So, and I, you know, I just, I lived in it. So maybe it's yeah. from you were being there and seeing him negotiate with the vendors and his staff and it sure. just became a part of my, you know, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, I suppose. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, gosh, you've just got an amazing skill that so many of us can learn from. And, and I think uh, there's already women here on the I Am window saying, Lori, come be a <laughs> You know, yeah. come back, mentor me and coach me on this. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, Lori, Yvonne on the call, she says, I find it hard to gauge when negotiations are even possible. Lori, mm -hmm. do you pick up on on uh, verbal cues or uh, behaviors where you see an opportunity? Wait, this is an opportunity for me to negotiate right here and now. Do yeah, you I think I'm always, I have three kids. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, 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 negotiation is a constant, I mean, every, every conversation is a negotiation. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, I guess just to reframe my question a little bit is um, when it's a peer of mine, mm. it's, I always feel hesitant. You know, it's great, you know, all these people on the phone, you know, kind of, you know, are asking for it as I'm offering it out. Where my hesitation is, is, you know, who who am I to to offer to mentor this person if I'm, I'm afraid that the reaction might be uh, that they're offended. Um, right that I'm offering that out. I guess that's what I'm looking for from the group. You know, I want to tell you a story uh, that just happened this morning. We in our organization, we're very fortunate to have Chris Capicella come and speak um, to our team. And he said something that I thought was really powerful, Lori. Lori, you just said something, you know, about offending somebody or and you, you want to help them. There's really mm -hmm. this true, uh, generous, giving that you want to give out. And um, anecdotally, um, Chris said, you know, the way Satya has been leading our SLT meetings on Fridays mm -hmm. is that he will say to Amy, Amy, did you know this week I learned from you how to blank? Mm -hmm. Terry, this week I learned from you or what you just showed me, Terry, I've now learned this. And what, and I thought that was powerful because yeah. That shows that Satya has just put his ego and checked it at the door, and he's mm -hmm. emulating and modeling for his SLT that they, too, need to be doing that and need to be credentialing, as Chris said it. I loved that word and putting credit where credit is due of what they've learned. And so, Lori, to me, actually, I think that you can exemplify that growth mindset and mm -hmm. emulate and model for others and by just reaching out and extending a hand. And they could take it or they won't. Mm -hmm. But to me, that is modeling collaboration and giving and growth mindset and sharing of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And whether they choose to take it or not, to me, that is a behavior that within our own culture and for those partners on the phone as well, I encourage you to take that forward that we need more of. That's just my two cents. Maybe there's somebody else on the call that has some other thoughts. Would you take it as an offense? Would you be off put by it? And, it, and is it all in the approach? I think those are all great, great questions. Wendy, did you have something to add? Just saw that you got off mute. Um, good, good discussion. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lori. And so, um, Again, do this on your own, but I just wanted to get you thinking about a negotiation you may be going into or a recent one and to really think through um, what was successful and what wasn't. Do I, does anybody else on the call have another story that you want to share, something that went well, something that went horribly bad, something that you're afraid of, something you're getting ready to negotiate on? 
Alicia, I also like in the IM window that you put the lean in circles as well. It's it's something that I've I've had kind of on my list of I'd love to do it, haven't had time to do it, but but I love that as an idea from the board of directors perspective as well. Sure, happy to sh share it. I'm I'm involved on the leadership team for the Seattle chapter of Lean In, and I've mm -hmm. just found it to be a really powerful and useful community of women to talk about these very issues and um, share each other's experiences. To to um, the earlier point, I think from I think it was Lisa or Lori, uh, you know, just hearing about other people's experiences helps everybody learn. So I don't think anyone needs to have necessary credentials. If something's worked for you, I think it's it's great to share it and um, and people have the opportunity to pick it up for themselves. Yeah. I agree. Well, wonderful. I think that wraps up then my time, my portion. Thank you so much for being such an engaged audience today. Hopefully you learned something. Happy to share this deck. Um, and I want to give credit also to Katie Quigley, um, who's my manager as well, um, who put a lot of work into this as well. And, and by the way, um, one of the things that we're working on in our team is as we develop decks like the one you just heard from me on, um, that we think are strong decks that maybe you all want to use or leverage or use on your own team, we welcome you to leverage uh, that as well. We're trying to build a library of decks that women can just use to help with your own speaking and presence and opportunities um, to grow and engage with other women as well. So if you're interested in this deck, we'll share it out and feel free to leverage it as well for your own, put your own name and your own stamp on it and use it uh, in your lean in circle or wherever else you think you would like to. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Heather, thank you so much. I The dialogue, I think, was great. It's always awesome that we have so many women on the call that are willing to participate, both um, via the chat window as well yes. as via um, just the verbal conversation that we're having. I think there was um, – clearly it's a topic that everyone, I think, um, can relate to. And so your insights were awesome. And I really appreciate you being on the call today. Thank you so much. And My pleasure. Um, we look forward to um, hopefully having you back or joining future calls um, to learn from some of the other women. So um, thank Wonderful. you very much, and everyone have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.